Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, farmers. Welcome to today's podcast. The episode today is with Erica Tebbins, who is a sales strategist and speaker and former farmer and actually worked for our farm for a number of years up in New York State. Um, But before I get into more about today's episode, I want to give a shout out to a few of you who have left awesome reviews over on iTunes. Um, So Flavio Guzman says, thanks for the wonderful podcast. Just what I wanted to hear. Looking forward to future episodes. Uh, Nick345123 says, so far they've been really great, diverse guests and the interviewer is informed and seems to push enough to dig deeper into some really great information. And I'm also getting a few responses on DMs on Facebook and people just saying how much they've enjoyed the podcast. So really appreciate the feedback, guys, and also appreciate the negative feedback. Got a few emails on things we can do to make the podcast better. And we we definitely are taking those into consideration and uh, we have a podcast review meeting coming up here before we start the second season and we will definitely go over those as a team. So appreciate your feedback and if you haven't yet, please go to iTunes and leave us a review. Five star would be great, but uh, give us what you feel like we deserve and a text review is awesome. So that really helps drive the rankings up. That really helps iTunes see us as a good podcast and helps it show it to more people. So really appreciate that. And thanks for the reviews that you guys have given so far. So back to today's episode, Erica, you know, worked for our farm for a number of years in upstate New York. And I really feel Erica is one of the keys. And we talk about in the episode of us really scaling the farm because we'd kind of hit a wall. I was solopreneuring the farm, running the farm with me. And then our business manager, while she was at that point, more a bookkeeper, taking on some of the more of the business responsibilities. But we were kind of very overwhelmed. And had, as I said, hit that brick wall. So Erica came in, really helped us systematize, really showed us the E-Myth book. And we started implementing that. And then she took on a lot of the marketing and sales strategy for us and really helped us grow that aspect. And when you grow your sales, you can grow your business. In today's episode, we dive into what her experience on both sides of the table has been because she's been a customer, she's been a stand manager, and then finally she ran her own farm for a year or two. And so she has experience on all three levels. She is now a sales strategist, so she has a lot of experience on that for farmers, as well as social media. We can talk about social media tips. We also talk about how to hire the best people for your market stands. One of the things we were known for is we had amazing staff, and a lot of it is directly attributed to the work Erica did in training them. We actually had a sales book that when people started working for us at the farmer's market, there was a book, a binder they actually got, and they'd actually have to read through and that taught them exactly how to run the market stand. So this is a great episode. I know you're going to enjoy it. Have a listen. Welcome to the podcast, Erica. Thank you for having me, Michael. I'm so glad to be here. Can you give us a little bit about your background? Yeah, I would love to. So currently I do sales strategy and I'm also a speaker and I work with predominantly women who run their own businesses and really struggle with figuring out how to sell. They worry about being pushy and they also are experts in what they do and what they are selling or offering, but they don't really understand how to market or strategize to have predictable, sustainable success in their businesses. And Mm. in my background, so how I kind of got to this point, Over 15 years ago, like, I mean, I've been selling for over 20 years and I've been leading and running businesses and teaching other people how to sell for over 15. We used to live in Seattle when my husband was stationed in the Navy out there. And I ran this very large, super high volume Calvin Klein store. And at that time we had, I mean, we were the fifth highest volume in the country. We had annual sales over 6 million. My staff was over 40 people, and I was responsible for training all of the managers in our West Coast division. So it was a lot, but I I really loved it. And then we moved out to upstate New York. My husband got transferred, and I just knew because our son Jack was, he had just turned four, and retail management life is not very conducive to a family schedule at all because you yes. are, you know you're always on when the rest of the world is off you're working weekends and holidays and all of that so 
I made the decision that I was going to not continue with that line of work, even though I'd had a lot of success with it. And lo and behold, I ended up uh, working for you when you were running your farm. And I just started as a regular old market worker. And as I always do in whatever it is I'm doing, I end up taking on more responsibility and starting to you know, manage different things. And so I took over the farm newsletter, the weekly newsletter. And then I started to say like, you know, hey, Michael, you know, like, what about this? Maybe we could do this. And basically what was happening was I had, was taking all of my prior retail experience and transferring it over to the farm and the farmer's market. And I know, and you can obviously speak to it more than I can, but we kept seeing all of this growth and it was really awesome. And in a time where, you know, we always think of farmers as struggling, but you know, Kilpatrick Family Farm was not struggling. We were doing really well and we had raving fans and this big following and people who loved us and would shop week after week. And so then I ended up, so from there, you know, I was doing the market staffing, hiring, training, scheduling, all of that for you. And then I ended up with a really unexpected but successful career in direct sales. And I did that for four years. And I, again, using the same systems that I teach, ended up progressing really quickly Uh, promoted really fast. I ended up in the top 3% of the company. And again, I was leading more like other women. I was teaching, I was training, selling again. Like it's, you know, it's this constant loop in my life of like, I always end up in this leadership role where I end up teaching and training other people how to sell successfully. But around the end of 2016, I realized that I was ready for a pivot, even though I was really at the height of my direct sales business. I had hit four huge goals in about six weeks time, but I realized that it was time to change. I felt very boxed in. I was only teaching uh, certain women in a, you know, one type of industry and one type of company. And I knew that what I was teaching and what I knew I could actually reach more and more people. So I shut that business down and then I started consulting and here I am. That's how, that's how I got here today. Yeah, I remember when we brought you on, um, as you said, it was just the market worker and then you started coming to the farm and then I just kept saying, well, she seems doing everything else really well, so let me just give her more stuff to do. (laughs) Yeah, basically, basically. (laughs) Yeah, and then I think the other thing too, so I mean, obviously the sales and marketing was huge keys for us, but I think the other thing that really made almost an even bigger impact on our business was you introduced us to like the E-Myth, to, you know, uh, service, you know, running a service-based company. Um, and that whole side of systematizing and treating our farm as a business. Yes, absolutely. Because I think it's so common when people start on their own. And again, like I said, like those people are the experts, like you were the expert at growing, like that was not my zone of genius at all. You know, my zone of genius was really figuring out, okay, how do we set things up so that they're more shoppable and which is, you know, what you do in, in corporate retail, you uh-huh. do floor moves, you you, you actually strategize those things. It's very intentional. Um, you know, training staff on really good customer service and sales techniques, all of those things that unfortunately so few farmers and other small business owners do. And it's mm-hmm. simply because they don't know how to do it. They just know the thing that they sell, but they don't know the sales and marketing part of it. Absolutely. Now, for a time, you also ran your own small farm and that was, you know, you really wanted to kind of experience that yourself. Talk to us a little bit about that as well. Yeah. So it's funny, I kind of always forget to mention that little piece, but but I guess it it was not a little piece in hindsight. Uh, It was just me, a one woman micro farm called Little Sparrow Farm. I uh, ended up because of working with your farm, getting really involved in the local food movement. Mm -hmm. sustainable farming. And so, you know, it led me to go to farming conferences and women in farming conferences and all of this stuff. And I wanted to try my hand at it. So I can my whole front yard garden, my annual garden into an area where I grew uh, organic greens and herbs because I had to get really strategic and figure out in such a small 
area, what could I plant that I could have multiple cuttings over the course of one summer, one season? Mm -hmm. And so greens and herbs it was. And I sold at our small village uh, farmer's market and then also to several local businesses that are a little bit more farm to table. And I really loved it. It was awesome. I'm so glad I did it. It was just, it was one of those things that for me all by myself to sell and market and grow and also homeschool my son at the same time, it was just way, way too much work for, for one person. So I shut that down. Um, that was kind of overlapped with my time with you and a little bit of my time um, in direct sales. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a good uh, bridge, but also it gave you a lot of experience into what goes into running a farm. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would get up. So Thursday was the farmer's market day. And since it's greens, you know, you gotta, you gotta get on that early. So I would get up super, super early every Thursday morning. I would, every Wednesday night, I'd have to clear out our refrigerator of, you know, make room because we didn't even have like an extra fridge for the market stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would harvest and I would literally sanitize our double kitchen sink and wash everything in there. And I had one of those large orange, like restaurant style salad spinners. Mm -hmm. Do it right in my kitchen and everything and then bag it right on my kitchen counter, (laughs) put it in the fridge and then take it down to the market in the afternoon. And I also had, I used to um, keep bees. So I had honey too, and I loved it and it was great. And I, I really would, I would like sell out every single week. You know, I would almost sell out and I would bring the excess to a few different restaurants. And it was great and I loved it, but just far too much work for one busy lady. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yes. So what does sustainable agriculture and more specifically a sustainable farm mean to you? To me, I think what is really important is I think there's a lot of focus on sustainability for the environment, which is obviously hugely, hugely important. But I think what gets lost in that conversation is sustainability to the farmer and the business itself. And if you are not making the money that you need to be making, it will not be sustainable. That is just a black and white fact. So mm-hmm. I think it's it's really crucial to talk about sales and marketing as much as soil conditions and you know how many plants you can put in a row and you know all things all of those components, all the growing aspect. It needs to be balanced with actually selling what you grow. Mm -hmm. And I think too, if we're going to try to change the direction that our country eats, that's an incredible important conversation, which farmers are too often left to the side of that because they're just so busy growing the food. Yes, it's true. And because obviously, again, like, yeah, farming just takes up a ton of personal time and energy into the actual growing and, you know, the prepping, the harvesting, all of that. Um, but it is really important to be part of that conversation because I feel like now more than ever, we really need to be taking big, big strides to preserve farmland, to get more people, especially younger people in the farming game and getting families on board with eating local and, and eating more sustainably. Yeah, because I think what's happened over the last decade, I would even say, is that people saw this trend, big business saw it and said, okay, how can we jump onto this bandwagon? And that's why you saw the proliferation of the meal kits. That's why you saw every single company out there greenwashing their brand. Um, all the grocery stores saying, hey, we're buying local, but it's you know 700 miles away. So yeah, I think it's incredibly important that we have these conversations and that we are clear and direct and marketing as farms direct so they know who we are and what we stand for. Yeah. And I know it can be a, you know, challenging from a time point of view and be challenging from a, it, you know, can feel really weird, but it really has to be on the farmer in a lot of cases to kind of go out of their way to get themselves known and to, I'll say, make some noise, but I don't mean that in like a negative, in a negative way at all. I just mean you know, the restaurant owners and other places that would like carry your products or use your products, they are also very busy too. And they don't necessarily have the time on their end to always be looking for the newest and best farm in their area or products or anything like that. So I am a big believer in the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And so it is important to not just wait around and hope that you get discovered and then asked to 
provide what you offer at your local farm table restaurant or local, you know, health food store, you really have to be very proactive in that arena. Yeah. And you know, one of the things we did, we were squeaky and I was always as part of the newsletter, sometimes you'd push me to write a piece about something, you know, happening in the economy, something happening on a national scale in relationship to farms to keep our audience engaged. You know, one of, I think one of the more <laughs> ones that we did was when a, the local casino called us and wanted us to sell them, you know, 10 pounds of greens in February for a photo shoot that they were doing because they were doing a new menu. And I was very clear and I said, are you guys saying you're going to be buying from us every single week after this? They're like, no, we just want it for the photo shoot so we can show that we serve local food. And I said, well, that is a complete baloney because you're not going to be serving local food. You just want to use me to build your business up and the 10 pounds of greens that you want are then not going to be going to my customers who are the ones who are supporting me every single week. So that message we went put out, you know, got massive traction in our community because they all saw, you know, kind of that greenwashing happening. Yeah. And stuff like that is not, you know, it's not okay by any stretch. And it is a real disservice to all of the hard work that does go into growing, you know, everything else that goes on behind the scenes to just put up that farce. But I I think it is really important to call out because there are so many companies that do take advantage of the greenwashing trend now. So it's unfortunate because I think that it, it makes it even harder and more confusing for consumers as well. And uh, it just, you know, it takes a lot more effort on our end to have to do some extra homework when we're Mm -hmm. buying from different places. Exactly. So there are endless tasks to be done on the farm, you know, running a business. How do you make sure to focus on and tackle your most vital priorities each day? Mm, So I have what I like to call my CEO day. And this is something I teach my clients as well. Okay. You might not have a whole day. So it could be the CEO hour or, you know, 15 minutes or whatever you have. But I really like to set aside Mondays as a time where I sit down and I do all my, I call it my like my money Monday. I go through all my financials. I see where I'm at. I look ahead at what is top priority that week in getting done. Sometimes if it's like a, from a planning point of view, sometimes I'll do it Friday before I'm, I'm done for the week or I'll look Sunday night really quick so I can get just a, a little bit of a head start on Monday mm-hmm. in terms of planning. But then I really dive right into anything that is going to be planning or I need to be in my office or, you know, content creation or focusing on the stuff in my own business. And then that way, the rest of the week, what I do is client work as much as possible. Tuesday through Friday is mostly focused like outward stuff that I'm doing with and for my clients. But I think it's really important because we can get really busy in all of the tasks that have to get done. Mm -hmm. I think it's really, really, really important whenever works for you. And it's going to be different for every single farmer and every single business owner but it really is important to find a pocket of time in your week that is just solely dedicated to taking a step back, getting a bird's eye view, and looking at what is going to make the most impact. Because sometimes we just have this tendency to make the to-do list and then feel like we have to get it all done. But at the end of the day, there are really a lot of, there end up being a lot of things that end up not being as important or urgent as we maybe thought initially. And I've had things where I realized by the end of the week, they never got done. And then I look at it and go, do I really need to do this? I mean, Mm -hmm. should I just like outsource this instead? Obviously nothing went sideways because it didn't get done. So does it actually need to get done? So I, I, I think it's important because there's no way anyone in any business is going to be able to tackle everything. So you need to have intentional time where you figure out what is going to get you the most return on your investment. So Mm -hmm. make the biggest impact your bottom line and also push you further down the road closer to the goals that you are working on. And then everything else can either be, you know, outsourced or just let go of (laughs) or put on like a parking lot list for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I struggle with is I find is all the things, you know, you know, I'm a classic squirrel. So I love to look at 9,000 things at the same time. (laughs) And uh, actually, Nicole and I were on a, a meeting just the other day and she's like, 
Yeah, Michael, I do appreciate that. In that last interview you did with one of the one of the podcast guests, you says you called yourself. Hey, you had ADHD. And she said, "I'm glad you said that because now I feel like comfortable calling you out." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But yes. <laughs> what it comes down to is that I have the list that I want to do and I have the list that I know I should do. And so for me, frequently it's saying, okay, do two things on the you need to do. And then you get to do one thing on the you want to do. Yeah. And you know what? It's funny because I did the same thing this week. And I think it's why you and I work so well together because I think we have our squirrely moments. Like we are both enough of like ambitious and squirrely that it it plays well off each other when we've had to work together Mm -hmm. in the past. So we don't get too much, you know, too far in the weeds. But I actually did that this week. Um, Since I'm launching my own podcast soon, I have pre-recorded bits that I really wanted to, you know, put my headphones on and open mm-hmm. up the laptop and put it all together because it's like this shiny new fun thing. Mm-hmm. But what I really needed to do was go back and re-edit a sales page and webinar slides and mm-hmm. um, an email sequence and all of that for relaunching my sales course. Mm-hmm. And I had to really get real with myself and say, no, put all the podcast stuff on next week because it's not urgent and it can wait. There's not a podcast deadline or anything, but there is a deadline for when you have to do this webinar. Mm -hmm. So I had to get very real with myself and then course correct and force myself to do the thing that really truly needed to get done because I know I'm somebody where like I could have made it happen, but I wouldn't have shown up. If I tried to do both, I would have shown up to my webinar more frazzled and it just would not have been good. So uh, I'm a bit more strict with myself now, but then, you know, then I gave myself a little break once it was all done, check my Instagram, get a cup of coffee. So I did, you know, treat myself a little, but now I know whenever my brain wants to have the little freak out, that's like, you should be doing the podcast stuff, get your headphones on, like, let's do this. I'm like, no, 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 that's happening next week. So I already mm-hmm. have it scheduled. I already know there's a space for it. So it'll yeah. Be- and you know, one of the things in converting that to like farming, I see some of these brand new farmers trying to do all the fun stuff of farming. And, you know, for me, that was the R&D, that was, you know, the trials, that was the, you know, making videos of the farm, that kind of stuff. And, you know, when you're first starting your farm, you need to focus on exactly what is making you the most money. And it's not that YouTube video. Usually it's you getting out there in the field and doing the work. And then, you know, if after you've built your farm and now your farm's successful and you have the team like we did when we were in that stage on our farm, then you can start doing the fun stuff. But you really need to be very careful, especially the beginning, to make sure that you're focusing on what is the most important or else you're going to go out of business real fast. That is so, so, so true. I feel like there's like two components there. Like there's the shiny object and the fun stuff. And there's also the feeling of, you know, everyone's doing this. Everyone has a CSA. Everyone's on Instagram. Everyone is, you know, doing X, Y, Z, whatever. And so we feel like, oh, well, I have to do it all as well. And if I'm not doing all of the things all the time, then I'm not going to be successful. But what people forget is, it's like, okay, your first year is you're getting all of your basics set up. And then your next year, you might, you know, expand your market offerings uh, or go into, you know, maybe add on an an additional farmer's market. And then Mm -hmm. maybe your third year, you do the CSA or, you know, it's it's different for every farm, Mm -hmm. every farmer. But if you try to do the CSA and the 12 farmer's markets and this, that, and the other, and everything in your first year, you will crash and burn because nobody, nobody can sustain all of that. And on the flip side, because, so my business is over a year old now, because Mm -hmm. it's the end of Q1 right now, I was running the numbers a couple nights ago. And I realized that Q1 this year, I have 10 X, more than 10 X Q1 last year when my business was a lot newer. Yeah. But Last year was such a building year because it was the first year, you know, just Mm -hmm. like in farming, like you have to prep the ground, you have to check your soil, add in any additions that you need, you know, to make it really fertile, plan everything out, a lot of trial and error. And, And I have to say, you know, there was a lot of just building courses, you know, building website, building connections, all of those things. And it can be really hard when you're like, okay, I just, I don't want to keep in my head down and doing the work. But as long as you can just keep your head down and do the work a little longer, you will get to that place where you start to see that momentum going. 
Yeah, that flywheel effect. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's so key on a farm is, you know, we got to the point where, you know, obviously I was showing up to get the crew started in the morning, but then I just kind of like went around my day and, you know, did this, that, and the other, popped into the office. But that was because we had spent six years putting that flywheel in place of the team, of the systems, of the employees, of the, the markets, all that kind of stuff, which just then ran seamlessly. Yeah, it's true. And I think that's the thing that, you know, people see and and I have the unique vantage point of I didn't know you right when you and Philip were starting the farm, but it wasn't too long in. Yeah. When I met you and I got to see a lot of that growth and then I, you know, I've seen you branch out and do the work you're doing now and and yeah, I mean there's, you know, it's it's kind of hard because people see the person you are now and it can be easy to not know how many years of struggle and trial and error and Three hurricanes. <laughs> yeah, three hurricanes and, you know, maybe like bad investments and, um, you know, horrible employees and all of these things that there were along the way, they just see the thing now. And they, then, then they feel like, well, shouldn't I be further along? And it's like, yeah, no, like everyone has to go through that, that hard part. And there's really never like a, like a perfect place. It's just, it's always continually, working, growing, evolving, getting better day by day. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So to that point, we stand on the shoulders of giants, you know, those who have gone before us. Tell us about the most influential lesson you ever learned from one of your mentors and how it helped you become the person you are today. Oh, gosh. Okay. So I have, let's see, I would say my biggest mentor. And it's funny because she's a fictional character and I have a little Funko figurine of her that sits right at my desk, but Leslie Nope from Parks and Rec. <laughs> yes. I love her. And, and for good measure, I have a Ron Swanson too. So they are side by side. <laughs> um, but there's this meme that says, you know, be the Leslie Nope of whatever it is that you do. Mm-hmm. And I really try to embody that because she is somebody who is really hardworking, but for the right reasons and for the right things. Mm -hmm. So if it's something that she believes in, that she knows is going to make a difference, that she's excited about, she will give it her all and she will keep going even when it's very hard, but she also wants to bring other people along with her. She wants Mm -hmm. to, you know, not just like necessarily take all the credit or get all the, the glory or all the gold stars. Like she really wants to include her team. She really wants to celebrate the people around her and she really wants to have fun. I think that is something that can be lost uh, in all the muck of running a business, especially literally if you're working on a farm uh, right now is, you know, Mm -hmm. peak mud season. So um, I, I think that that is important too. So it's the kind of like work hard but have fun mentality. Um, And then I will also say, this is probably a little divergent for your listeners, but for any of the female farmers listening, Denise Duffield Thomas is Mm. a funny mindset mentor for women. Um, She has courses and she has books. Her new one is called Showpreneur and I love it. I just finished it. But that has been really huge because we have a lot of blocks around making money, especially... Mm -hmm. Farmers, because we have this deep culturally ingrained belief that if you farm, you are also supposed to just be poor. And, uh, and that is not the case. And so, you know, money mentality really will put you in a position of trying to be the cheapest at the market rather than the best and being the cheapest is not a financially sustainable thing that you should be doing for your farm. No, I think that's key. And, you know, our farm was the most expensive at the farmer's market by far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I still think we sold far more than most other people. Well, we did. I know we did. I mean, looking at the how empty our truck was and how full it was compared to the growers. And I'm not saying we were the absolute highest quality either. You know, Brian Dennison, who pff, that guy could farm. I mean, he just, he grew beautiful, perfect crops every single week. And I remember him coming over to our stand, standing there and shaking his head asking me how I got the customers to line up the way I did. Because we had more customers than he did, but he had the perfect product. And it was all because of the raving fans that you had built at our table, at our stand, that that loved our brand. 
Yeah, that really is incredibly crucial. And I think that a big part of that really is having that confidence, that Leslie Nope confidence. She's not braggy or, or anything. She's humble, but she's also confident that she's good at what she does. And she provides a lot of value to people with the work that she does. And that's how I view my role now in consulting. And I really feel like that was what we did as a farm was we knew that we were putting out a quality product and we had really good service. And if there was ever an issue, we were going to make it right. And that we had an expectation that our relationship with our customers was not a one and done. It was Mm -hmm. a, here you go and we'll see you next weekend. Mm -hmm. It was a, hey, you had a funeral, you're out of town, we're delivering the turkey to your house and putting it in your fridge. And I actually think that turkey we never got paid for. But anyway. <laughs> you know what? It's, it's good karma. It'll, you know, exactly, yes. They'll pay it forward. <laughs> yes, exactly. But yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And, and that's kind of, you know, one of the tenets of our business is when we work with farmers is that, you know, you have to have this mindset that you're producing this incredible premium product and that you need to be reimbursed and for that, for the effort and the time and the, the love that you put into that. Yes, absolutely. Cool. So you've seen a lot of farms. What systems would you like to see farmers go back and put in place sooner rather than later and why? Again, I would say setting aside some CEO time, again, does not mm-hmm. have to be a full eight hour day. I mean, even mm-hmm. in my own business now, I don't spend a full eight hour day on it. Get some CEO time so that you have regular perspective on your week. Uh, you know, take off the kind of employee hat of being the employee in, in your business and put it from the lens of if you were, you know, the CEO of your business. I would say that. And I would also say, don't be afraid to get some financial help. Uh, for my own farm, I used Kiva.org twice. Mm-hmm. I love it. Um, that was a, a really great experience. And so it's okay if you need to get some money to help you out. There's no shame in asking for that support. And I would say also niching and outsourcing. So mm. I think outsourcing, a lot of times people forget, you know, we think outsourcing like, oh my gosh, I have to hire a 40 hour a week employee and then I have to deal with tax stuff and blah, blah, blah. But no, like even when I had my direct sales business, my sweet little son, I would ask him if he could put my little sticky labels on my catalogs for me while we were, you know, watching TV at night, like Uh little things like that. Like that's outsourcing. There's little projects that you, like, I know you hired a lot of amazing high school age kids. Like there's Uh really great young people who are happy to work for minimum wage to get experience and a little bit of spending money and you can hire them for five hours a week and they can just get some things off your plate. But Mm -hmm. I also think that, again, narrowing your focus and not trying to do all things, like I will use Carrie of the Looney Farm as a perfect example of this because Mm -hmm. she is now expanding, but she really got herself known as the best lettuce in her area. And so rather than trying to grow every crop under the sun, she got really, really good about getting known for one thing and doing it well. And then that was able to bring in the money to expand her business. And she's also creative and get, I know she gets her kids to help her on the farm too. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. No, she's, uh, she's absolutely one of our favorites and she is absolutely going to crush it this year. Yeah. I mean, I, I tell it to my clients too, like even just in the regular world of business, you have to niche it's really important. And that doesn't mean that you can't grow a diversity of crops. But I mean, I know even for us, it always makes me laugh because you don't even like tomatoes, but we really got known as like the place that has really good tomatoes, like really good Mm -hmm. heirloom tomatoes. We were first to market. We had a premium price and we would sell a heck of a lot of tomatoes week Mm -hmm. after week. Yeah, you're right. I I still do not like fresh tomatoes. Um, (laughs) And every single year I try. (laughs) But um, I would actually have you and the other team taste the tomatoes and tell me what the flavor was like so that I could describe it to the customer. Because yeah, yeah, I was like, well, it tastes like a tomato and they don't want to hear that. They want to hear, oh, well, this tomato tastes like this and this and all this. So yeah, I could use you guys to help me tell that story. Exactly. Hey there, Michael here. If you're loving this podcast episode with Erica, you're gonna love the free Farmer's Market Challenge that she and I will be running here in a little bit. So struggling with Farmer's Market sales, trying to increase them, 
jump on over to farmersmarketchallenge.com, sign up. In this free three-day challenge, you're going to discover, first thing is how to charge more and sell more with simple customer service techniques. Second, the right way to set up your stand layout to draw customers in and make them want to buy. Third, we'll give you a simple, done-for-you way to increase orders of hard-to-sell but profitable items that help you go home empty-handed every time. And this is all delivered over three days. It's a 10 or 15 minute video and then a quick five to 10 minute task that you can use at your next farmer's market to increase sales. All right, head over to farmersmarketchallenge.com and sign up. All right, so let's uh, shift a little bit. What one strategy or recipe that a farmers and their teams could consistently apply every day would compound in the big wins for them? And this, you know, maybe on the marketing side or might be on the, the sales side. I would say be visible and form relationships with people. And what I mean by that is you don't have to have a huge social media marketing campaign or you know anything like that, especially for a lot of people that feels daunting. Mm-hmm. But people have to know that you exist. So just having a presence, you know, if you are out in the field doing something or you're seeding, like, you know, right now I, I follow a lot of farms on Instagram. So, you know, I keep seeing pictures of people's seed trays and little sprouts coming up and, uh, you know, prepping beds and, you know, snow melting away and doing all of that. Like, just showing up, just reminding people like, hey, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is why I do it. And like, this is why you should care about it. Mm-hmm. So just letting people know and working on ways to, you know, just be memorable. And it, this does not have to be like a, anything corny or anything like that, but just, you, we're all very busy. We see a lot. We see a ton of messages and images and everything every day. And so it's important that we remind people that we exist. Mm-hmm. And then also, I would say to really focus on building those relationships with the people who are shopping with you and serving them really well and turning them into raving fans is going to help a ton. I mean, I'm sure, you know, I know there's stuff on the growing and in everything that you could, you know, do every day to make sure that you have this compounding effect. But at the end of the day, you know, like you said, even though there may have been technically some better produce at our market, the reason that we had people again and again is because we were very consistent. We would keep people up to speed on what we did. You know, we would always update the Facebook page. We had the weekly newsletter. We kept people in the loop. We did the collaborative farm dinners in our local community. And we always really like treated our clients at the market like humans who we appreciated rather than just people giving us their money. Yeah. And I think the other thing we did is we showed up at every single market year round. And so they knew they could count on us. And so they just would come back. Yeah. And I think the consistency, I mean, with everything, with visibility, with customer service, with quality of product, you know, I think it's really important to know that from the consumer end, that the experience that you're going to get can be predictable every time. And again, you know, things happen, you know, sometimes a melon looks great on the outside. You think it's ready. They get it home. It's not they mention it the next weekend and it's like, okay, well, we're going to make that right. Like we're not going to make you jump through hoops because we screwed up. So we're going to make it right. We're going to turn this into a win for both of us. And people really respect that. And especially I feel like nowadays, because you don't often find that level of service a lot of places. Yeah. And, and to that point, we always wanted our customers to come out ahead. Um, and frequently, if they're buying a lot of product, we threw in something free or the raving fans were the first ones that we'd say, hey, we have only 12 strawberries this week, but because you're a special fan, we saved them back here. Would you like one of them? So yeah. that's the kind of stuff that, you know, had people every single week. And we actually had customers that would text us and say, hey, I need three heads of lettuce, this type. Can you hold them for me at the back of the table? Because I can't get there right on time. And we would do it. Yeah, it took us more time. Yeah, it was out of the, it was a struggle because usually they would text me or they text you. And then we have to text the people that were actually at the market about it and make sure they did it. So uh, Shopify really wasn't a thing when we were farming. But if it was, and a lot of people are now tracking with either like Square or Shopify, like the annual value of a customer, I bet our customers were off the charts because of that personal attention. Yeah. And I think that is a really, really great example. And I know too, like when you actually get to know 
people, then you become more valuable to them because you know their likes and dislikes. You can make better recommendations. You can upsell to them better because of that. If they say, I need a recipe for X, Y, Z, you already know that, okay, a few weeks ago you gave them this one recipe. And then, you know, a few months back, you think you gave them that recipe as well. So like you can actually kind of have that continuity Mm -hmm. and say, oh, wait, you know, have you tried this? Like I just, you know, I made this tomato pie recently or, you know, whatever it is. And it's really those little things that are so, it's so hard to quantify or necessarily give a specific, but it's like when you know those people really well, you can can actually serve them better, but it takes time and it takes being intentional to say, I want to actually get to know people who are spending money with me. And I think that people assume that this takes a ton of time and energy, and it really doesn't. It's just something as simple as if they say, hey, I'm having people over for dinner. Do you have any suggestions of you know something I could make? And then you can ask those simple questions like, oh, are there any allergies? You know, are people vegetarian or vegan or anything like that? Like just by asking a few simple questions, it shows your customer that you actually want to give them the best solution, that you actually care. You want to make sure they're happy with their purchase, that their guests are delighted with the experience and that becomes memorable. And then they trust you. And we Mm -hmm. will spend money time and again with people that we know, like, and trust like again and again and again, and we will send our friends, we will tell our family all of it. And that is where, again, that's where that flywheel effect comes in. I want to talk about how you actually scheduled the farmer's markets too, because you would overschedule the markets so that we would have one person who could roam and just chat. Yes. So this was definitely something I took from retail management and it helps a lot. So obviously you can never fully predict what is going to happen on a day or how busy it's going to be or not busy it's going to be. But I would always make sure, and you know, eventually you can kind of track it with your markets and see there's obviously peak times and slower times but I would schedule us pretty heavy at the beginning of the day because for our markets, the bulk of people, there'd usually be a big rush the first hour. So I wanted to be fully staffed for that. So it would be, you know, all hands on deck, selling, selling, selling for that first hour. And then it would kind of dip down. And that was when anyone who wasn't actively selling, we would be, I mean, as we were selling, we would be refilling too, but we would do a huge refill push, refill all the tables, get everything fresh looking again. And then we would make sure, you know, that's when we would start, you know, people would take breaks, they would go get drinks or snacks, but we would always make sure that there was at least one person who wasn't too bogged down with actually ringing people out that could mingle, that could walk around. Just like when you're in a store and somebody's like, Hey, are you, know, are you looking for anything specific today? Or is there anything I can help you find? Or just to let you know, you know, our salad mix is two for seven today or whatever, because it helps. It really helps. Like, again, we, people are overstimulated all the time, especially at a farmer's market. There's a lot of noise and people and things to look at. And so you can have the greatest signage on earth, And there will still be people who don't notice that your salad mix is two bags for $7 that on special. So it helps to have that person that's going around and there might be something like maybe they need radishes for something and they are on a different table and they just, customer doesn't know that they're there because they can't see them, but you know where they are. So when they go, yeah, you know, I need like a, a lot of radishes for, you know, for this dish or whatever you go, oh, great. Let me take you over. Let me get those for you. Whereas if you just left them to their own devices, they might just go, well, I don't see the radishes. So I'll just wander off to another stand then. Mm -hmm. Um, So I know it feels hard because it's like, oh, I'm going to have to pay that other person. But if you have a stand of any size and you have a really busy market, it is very important. As long as that person is trained well and they're doing their job well to actually sell and serve people, they will easily make, I would say probably, you know, many, many times per hour what you're actually paying them to be there. Yeah. And we, I think, what was the, was it $400 per person per market that we wanted them to be making us? I think so. Yeah. That sounds, yeah. that sounds about right. But I mean, you got to think, you know, in a whole hour, even if you're, you know, if you're paying somebody 10 
bucks. And if they are going around and answering people's questions and they're upselling and they're letting people know about specials you're running or new products or anything like that, you can easily get a customer spend up way higher than if you were making that same person do it themselves. Because at the end of the day, like we have to remember we are the expert in what we do. Our customer is not the expert. So Uh then the the responsibility is on us to educate and serve and help them. Yeah. And they're happy to spend that extra money because they feel like they've been served and that they've learned so much more about the food that they've not just purchased. Exactly. So another thing we did was the, the blue shirts and the bags. Talk to us about, you know, kind of what our strategy with that. Yeah. So I know that team KFF, we are very pro Apple products and (laughs) anyone who, I mean, a little sidebar, Michael grew a melon called the snow leopard because (laughs) of the snow leopard operating system. I fully remember that. That is a real thing that happened, but we had just like the uh, people at the Apple store, they have Royal blue shirts so that you can spot them easily. And they also float around the whole store. Apple is like such a great example of good salesmanship. They flow all around the store. They don't just stay behind a counter checking people out. You know, you can catch them. Like if you need some help, you can easily spot who is the worker and who is somebody just shopping. And so, yeah, every year our market staff had the bright blue shirts. And so we were very branded. Like people knew we worked for Kilpatrick Family Farm. We had the logo on the front. Uh, We had, you know, market crew imprinted on the back. So it was very simple. And we would also all have uh, money belts on that, you know, kind of like, you know, when you go to a diner and somebody has their, their little apron, but ours had money in it and we would keep shopping bags in our back pocket. Um, So our CSA members would, one of their perks was they would get reusable shopping bags, but we would also have plastic bags in our pockets. So when it was really busy, whoever was floating in the stand, you also get a lot of people who don't want to wait in lines. And Apple's really good about this. They have their people carry around the little pads that they can just check people out from wherever they are in the store. So mm-hmm. we would do the same. So if somebody was way you know, over at a different table and our line was pretty backed up, we could actually start going out and floating. The extra people could float around and then check people out right where they were. And that brings in more money because that way when people have, you know, maybe just one or two items, they look over and they go, I don't want to wait in that line. I'll just go to a less busy farm stand and you don't miss that sale that way. So that was, that was a big game changer for us, I think as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So one challenge that many farmers face is finding, hiring, and keeping great teams. Um, What strategies have you implemented and did you implement to bring on the right kind of team members? Yeah, that's a great question. So I always really liked to start with the people who already loved us, who already knew who we were, what we were all about, believed in our mission, loved our product, all of it. So a lot of times I would reach out to CSA members and regular customers and start there because they are already people who understand and have a sense of what the work entails. And a lot of them were moms who, you know, maybe were home all week with their kids and they wanted just, you know, a little extra spending money and time to do something where they, you know, didn't have to get childcare for their job. And those women were amazing. And, you know, we had some men too. So I won't, you know, it wasn't just all always women, but um, also people who really loved to cook and were knowledgeable. That was incredibly helpful. I have to say, it really sounds like a weird thing, especially, you know, when you're talking about the actual farming side, it's less important. But on the selling side, it really, really helps to have that knowledge so that when people are asking you questions or maybe there's a less common vegetable, you can actually have workers there who know what they're talking about when they say, oh, you know, Jerusalem artichokes. Oh, okay. Well, you could do this with them or this with them. Or, you know, what I like to do is X, Y, Z. And that is, is honestly a huge asset to have people who are knowledgeable about what to do with your products. And I will say, you know, don't shy away from younger people either. I know we had Kieran for Mm -hmm. a billion years who worked for us, started as a teenager. 
when I worked at Calvin Klein, the best people I ever hired were 16 year olds as their first job. And that Mm. is because when you have not worked somewhere, you have not developed bad habits from other bad working environments, you know, bad managers or toxic workplaces or anything like that. Those new people don't have any of those experiences. So you can show them how to be a good worker from the get go. And that was huge. And some of those people, you know, I hired some people at 16. That was over 10 years ago. I am still friends with them. They are awesome, amazing adults now. And they did great, great work for me. So I would say, you know, do not discount that. I know in terms of our actual farm work with Kilpatrick, there were a lot of young people who were very dedicated Mm -hmm. and very hardworking. And I think that a lot of times, you know, teenagers kind of get this bad rap, but you know, like a, a good, motivated, strong, energetic kid will, you know, they can get a lot done. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, if you have, if you have people who maybe you don't know yourself, but maybe you have friends who have teenagers or you could go to the local school and say, Hey, do you have anyone, you know, maybe they're on honor roll. Maybe they are already a kid that has, you know, really good work ethic that we're hiring. We need, you know, one or two people for the summer. That's big. So, so don't discount it and don't discount the the people who are already uh, customers, regular customers of yours, because you never know who might want to work, you know, five, 10 hours a week and would mm-hmm. be an excellent, excellent hire for you. Yeah, absolutely. So let's move into marketing. We've kind of been, you know, talking about the whole time, but where do you think farmers should start with their marketing? Um, you know, there's so many options for them nowadays. Mm. So I would say you don't need to stress too much about oh my gosh, I need a perfect logo and a perfect website and it's going to cost me all this money and everything. You don't need to. That can always be changed. I can't even tell you how many times I've gone through and just like refreshed mine over the last year and a half, even in my my new business. But pick something and have it be consistent and have it on everything. So one thing I really liked that we did was when we had our cards, like marketing cards for each product, it had the Kilpatrick Family Farm logo in the bottom corner. Mm -hmm. So that way, you know, and it was on our banner and it was on our shirts and it was on the side of the truck and it was just, everything was very consistent. So that way you just, you just knew like this, you know, this came from them. Um, When I had my own farm, my setup looked the same week after week, like stylistically, again, it's that continuity. People know what to expect and make it look nice. Like make it, make your stuff look presentable. It truly matters. And I know it seems like one of those things where maybe it's not a big deal, but when you have bins under your table of your extra stock, like make sure your front of your tablecloth hangs down far enough that people can't see those because, Mm -hmm. you know, a health concern, like it's not that it's just, and people might not even consciously be aware of it, but to customers that are doing a quick walkthrough before they decide where they're going to shop, it is just a little bit cluttery. And our brain doesn't like that. Our brain Mm -hmm. likes things to be very simple, very clear and nicely presented. And so just make sure that your your tablecloth is long enough and keep your bins um, behind. And then I would say too, like you don't need to be, you don't need to have a super fancy website. You can get, you know, really inexpensive Squarespace or one of those and just have a little bit of, you know, general info on there and update it in the off season as you go. And like, if you want to be on Instagram, be on Instagram. Like if you want to be on Facebook, be on Facebook or, you know, be on both. But what's more important than being on a million different platforms is that you show up consistently on whatever you're Mm. on. And also that, you know, the people that you're marketing to, where are they? Is it like a slightly older crowd? Are they on Facebook more or are they on Instagram more? Or can you just like link your accounts and cross post That's one thing you can do, but to be consistent is more important than just simply posting once a week, like, oh, hey, reminder, the farmer's market's tomorrow. Like people, Mm -hmm. that's pretty stale and you'll get lost in the shuffle. So show, show people like who you really are and what you're all about and um, have a consistent message that you are getting across to customers and, and your potential customers as well. You know, a couple of things that are pet peeves of mine is farmers that show up with, you know, a dirty t-shirt and dirty fingernails. 
And they may think, oh, it's the badge of being a farmer. But I think when they show up like that to the market, people understand that they're handling the food they put in their mouths. And so they want a clean environment for that. And even though it may, they may not say anything, I think subconsciously that can turn them off. Yeah. And it's funny. It's like that bin thing. And I know it seems like, oh my gosh, you know, who cares? Like how, why is this even a thing? But it really, again, it does matter. It's like, it's like why you tidy up your home when you're going to host a dinner party. Usually, Mm -hmm. you know, like, because you want to make a good impression. You know, if they're your friends, like, you know, hopefully not going to judge you too harshly, but like you're inviting somebody into your space. So you want to make it presentable for them. And I view it the same way in business. So yes, you might be on hot pavement parking lot or, you know, a dirt pavilion or anything like that, but it's important to make things look as clean and presentable as possible. Whatever you use for a tablecloth, wash it every single week, wipe it Mm -hmm. down, make sure it's clean, make sure your signage is clean. If it gets mucked up, like fix it, keep your excess bins and stuff, keep it underneath, keep it out of sight, look clean and presentable yourself, be smiling, be standing, be walking around, look happy, look like you're ready to help people and keep your product really full. I know we would always say, uh, and I mentioned it in Small Farm U in one of my modules was our motto of pile it high and watch it fly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you sell down on things, you can readjust how you have your setup but always make it look very full and very fresh and clean so that people uh, feel compelled to want to shop it, to want to go over and look at what you've got. Because if you have, you know, if your greens are all like wilty and yeah, you, you know, you look all dirty and haggard and tired and all of that. And then there's like right across the way, there's a, a different farmer that looks clean and refreshed and their greens look all crisp. Like, who are you going to go with? Like, you're going to go with the one that looks like a more enjoyable shopping experience overall. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What would you say the biggest lies that farmers believe about marketing are? Um, that people only shop for what's cheapest. That, that is a thousand percent the number one. That people will treat the farmer's market like they would like Walmart or regular grocery store shopping. It is so not true. The farmer's market is, for a lot of people, it's an experience. It's a weekly outing. It's something special. It's them making a stand for what they believe in and how they want to spend their food dollars, how they want to, you know, treat the environment. There's all sorts of reasons. And it's not to say that, you know, people that shop at the farmer's market don't also shop at the grocery store. They obviously do. But the people who go to the farmer's market, especially regularly, are not always going to just be looking at cheapest they have a lot of other things in mind as well. So you do not have to be the cheapest at market in order to be competitive. I would say that is far and away the top one. And I would also say the other thing is that the only way for you to succeed is by doing what everyone else is doing or has historically done. Like, again, I'll use you as an example. So we had the free choice, for the most part, CSA which was at the time totally against the norm. Mm -hmm. And we would, you know, sell out of our CSA like every year. And it was really because you are not somebody, and, and I'm the same way, who aren't afraid to zig when everyone else zags. Yeah, we always looked at the new crops we could grow. And we always were trying to figure out how can we do this and take it to the next level? Or even if someone told us it can't be done, I would always say, well, watch me try. <laughs> yes. yes, I am. I'm totally the same in, in every business I've ever run and even just in my personal life. And I think that, uh, and this is just kind of, I think in general, kind of good advice, but be mindful of whose advice you are letting creep into your head. So if somebody else is a struggling farmer and they are burnt out, you know, or other entrepreneur or whatever, you don't need to listen to them. If they like poo-poo something that you're doing or trying to do or, or anything like that, or they're, you know, critiquing or they're like giving you a warning about, you know, this, that, or the other, like you can accept the information politely, but you don't have to like believe it. You don't have to act on it because it's really important to make sure that the people that you are getting inspired from, 
that you're getting your information from, that you're learning from, that you are surrounding yourself with. Also have a positive growth mindset. And I know that sounds kind of corny, but it's true because it's so important when you are running your own business to surround yourself with other people who will root for you or cheer you on or give you advice that's actually beneficial and isn't just coming from a place of like, oh yeah, well, I don't know, you're, that probably won't work or whatever. Like you don't need to listen to those people because mm. those people don't have the right mindset. It's important to have the right mindset and surround yourself with people who also have a good mindset. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the importance of merchandising. So we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but a couple of things that we did for merchandising was obviously the nice tablecloths, the the clean signs. You know, we would do some clear recipe cards and that sort of thing. Yeah. So I know that over the years we, and again, you know, because this is one of those things where I don't want somebody to hear it and go, oh my gosh, I don't have enough time. And now I have to make all this stuff for the summer. And I don't know if I can do it. No, like this was stuff that we implemented little by little, you know, season after season. But we had, I think there are about like four by six inch laminated cards, pre-printed. A lot were pre-printed with our crop name, the logo. And then some of, you know, we'd have like a, an empty spot for the price on there. And that way we could hand write it in with a dry erase marker at the market. Or if it was something that we never really changed the price on, like we would just have the price pre-printed. And it was nice to have those laminated and ready to go because we had so many crops that it was easy to just get them out. They were very clear. We didn't have to worry about anyone's messy handwriting or anything. So it made all of our signage very simple. And we would tack those right at the item because our stand was pretty big. That way people didn't have to go and look at like a big chalkboard or something with all of the products and prices. It was just literally right there. And we would also make call outs for if things were on sale. We had um, separate little cards that were, you know, bright red or bright yellow to denote that that item was on sale. We would also put stuff in what I like to call hot spots. So depending on how big or small your stand is, there are always those areas that are on aisles or, you know, where people are walking by or going to catch people's attention. That is where you want to put your show stoppers. So Mm -hmm. when our tomatoes, you know, when we'd be first at market with the heirlooms, we would have a whole table right on the aisle dedicated to the tomatoes, you know, make this whole cool display with our little tomato trays and everything. And we would make it look really good. And you just couldn't miss it. You'd be walking right by and it would, you know, oh my gosh, like, look at those tomatoes. So it's kind of like when you are at a mall or a shopping plaza or boutique or wherever, and they have the window display, obviously at the farmer's market, you know, you don't have a big glass window, but you can use that same concept because the window display and the reason why stores change it all the time is it's to catch your eye. It's so that you go, oh, that's new. That's, you know, well, I wasn't planning on buying, you know, a new sweater, but that sweater is really cute. I'm going to go on in and take a look. And then once you're in that store, then you might end up buying other stuff as well. So always put your showstoppers in hot spot areas where people will notice them. And then I think, again, also you yourself, like one of my biggest pet peeves is the folding chair behind the table and Mm -hmm. the person just sitting in it. Like unless you have mobility issues, you got to be on your feet. You have to be catching people's eyes. You know, when they walk by... If they look at your, your stuff, smile at them, catch their eye, say, Hey, you know, Hey, how's it going? How are you? Because it just gives people a pause. It gives them a moment to really actually take in what you have to offer. And then in that pause, they go, Oh my gosh, wow. Look at those heirloom tomatoes or, you know, look at that, whatever it is. And they're more likely to come over and then engage with you than if you're giving off this presence of that you can't be bothered. I hate that so much. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, to kind of zero in on that too, we had a a very standard greeting. And the reason for this was there was a a talk that I listened to, and I think maybe you listened to or is from previous, that if you get someone to say they see something negative, even if it's negative, not about your stand, they'll end up probably not buying from you. So if you say, can I help you? They can say either yes or no, or I'm just browsing. But if you say, how are you? 
most people are going to say, I'm great or I'm good. And so that's a positive reaction. And subconsciously, that's so much more important to get them to say. And then we always follow up with, hey, if you need anything, we're here, just let me know. And then we would go back to doing something because the worst thing is you're someone standing there looking at your stand and you get an employee standing there staring at you, watching you do that. And at that time, you want to move along so much faster. So anyway, yeah, that was just something psychologically that we really focused on with our team. Yeah. And I think too, like, I will say, you know, if you're listening and you have been someone who sits behind, like, I don't want anyone to feel bad or to feel shamed. Cause I know that a lot of times it comes from a place of, well, you know, I've worked all week. I'm tired. I'm finally at the market. I get to rest or, well, I don't want to be imposing. I don't want to be pushy. So I'll just sit here. And then if they need help, they'll ask me, but people don't ask. Like, I mean, not some people will, most people won't. They'll just, you know, go on their way. So by you engaging them first, by you looking like you're interested. And yeah, the open-ended questions are really important because our gut reaction when somebody says, do you need help finding anything? No. Even if you do, like our gut reaction is to say no. But yeah, you say like, oh, hey, how's it going? How are you? you? You know, any of those polite things like that. One of the things I would always say is I would just, like a lot of times I would say my name. Like I would say, hey, you know, if you need anything, if they're like, no, I'm just like, you know, look around or whatever. I would say, okay, well, my name's Erica. I'm just going to be over there filling stuff. But, you know, just holler if you need me. And it lets them know that they've been seen, you know, they've been acknowledged, that you're ready, willing, and able to help. And that you aren't going to be like awkwardly staring at them the whole time while they're trying to look around, but that you're there if and when they're ready to check out or in case they have a question. And you've given them your name so they feel much more comfortable coming to you. Yeah, it's that like personal, again, it's that building relationships thing. It is really, really crucial. And also another thing that's really important is um, if somebody asks you a question, and this is something, you know, if you're the farmer, like you might know, but if you have other staff, this is a good thing to train them on, especially if they are not actual farmers themselves, is if somebody asks a question and they don't know, say, you know, I don't know, but let me find out for you. Because rather than just going, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know. Because then it's like, okay, well, all right. I mean, I guess, thanks. Like, have a good day. But taking that extra second, I mean, there'd be plenty of things people would ask me and I'm like, you know, they'd say, oh, were these tomatoes grown in the, are these the ones from like the greenhouse or are these in the field? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't, you know, hang on, let me go, let me go ask Michael or, you mm-hmm. know, Jonathan or whoever it was. And then I would find out and that they appreciate that because again, it's just, it's showing that respect that you care about doing the right thing for them. Absolutely. So everything is moving online these days. How can farmers adapt to that? I would say, again, you don't need to hire a designer. You don't need to put all your profits back into that. There's a lot of good ways to make branded graphics, like on Canva. And again, lots of different website platforms you can build your own. There are a billion social media tutorials and things like that as well that you can use. So I would say embrace it. Don't worry about being a perfectionist with it. If you feel like, oh, I'm so stressed out because Instagram, like people are talking about hashtags and the grid and like all of this. If you think of it really as a way of social media is a way to be so It's just an online way of building relationships where you're not doing it face-to-face. You're just doing it through a digital platform. So treat it like you would if you were, you know, at a party or, you know, like a dinner party or a networking event or anything like that. Like just be real, show up as you really are. It's okay to be funny. You know, it's okay to educate people through your platform about, you know, different things you're doing. Again, I'll divert to Carrie of the Looney Farm. She does a great job. Like she'll just post stuff that's like, hey, this is what we're doing this week in the field. Hey, we just, you know, it's like a selfie of her with a new expanded field behind her. Hey, we just Mm -hmm. expanded our growing area. Here's what we're going to put here. Or, you know, hey, we're at the market or whatever. Whatever you're doing, just people like to feel involved. They love to see behind the scenes. This doesn't mean you have to overshare. Like, please don't overshare. But 
and don't be like grumbly or, or negative or anything like that. But now that people can kind of get a window into the businesses that they might want to spend their money with, they really like that. So I would say, don't be afraid of it, you know, embrace it. And there's always going to be new things that you learn with it, but just, um, you know, little baby steps, just embrace it and don't worry too, too much. Like don't get too bogged down in like, oh my gosh, I need 30 perfect hashtags and all of that. Just be consistent and show up and show your, your brand and, and why people should want to buy from you instead of the competition. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people out there that have this and there's all different variations, but it's better to get going than to to not do it at all. Uh, you know, it's better to be not perfect and just get it out there than to, you know, never launch it or never share it because it, it would take too long to be perfect. Oh yeah. There's no such thing because by the time that you get it perfect, like an algorithm changes or, you know, it's more, I, I love the concept from Brooke Castillo, but B minus work. Mm-hmm. Because B minus work is fine. You can impact the world on B minus work and you can always tweak it later. I mean, I've tweaked so much stuff over time. I mean, every single year with the farm, every single year we would reevaluate our stand, our setup. Mm-hmm. And you know what? Like mid year, we didn't have a panic attack about it because we knew in the off season that was when that was scheduled and we would get it done and we would reevaluate it then. Mm-hmm. But it was important at some point to take some time and you know, you can do that too. You can go back through in the off time and figure out like what do we need to refresh on our website or this, that or the other thing. But yeah, just get going, get yourself out there. You can all always course correct and pivot along the way. Absolutely. So do you believe that now is the best time to be starting to farm? And if so, why? Yes. I would say there is never a bad time to start a business. If you are, you know, motivated, if you're passionate, if you're doing it for the right reasons, and if you are not going to give up at the first or even the fifth obstacle, I would say that there's never really like a a bad time to start a business. And I would say, especially farming, because we are losing farmers every day Mm -hmm. and we need you to grow food. We absolutely do. You don't need to grow all the food. You don't need to grow every crop, but having diverse farms, having active farmland, it really, really matters. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, nobody expects it to be the easiest, most carefree life but it is important. So I think that if you're feeling like it's your calling, if you feel like it's something that you want to try your hand at, then absolutely do it. Even if it means starting small, I would say definitely do it because, Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the the world is precarious and, um, you know, yes, there are some scary components in terms of climate and, and all of that. But at the end of the day, one thing that all people have in common is we eat. Mm -hmm. And we need food and we need healthy, sustainable food. So yes, definitely do it. Mm, That's so good. Where can people find out more about you? Yeah, so you can go to, there's a few places, ericatebbins.com or find me on Facebook and Instagram at Erica Tebbins Consulting. Those are probably the best places. And if you go on to ericatebbins.com, right on the homepage, you will see a a little opt-in there that is all about my no sleaze sales formula. You just pop in your first name, your email address, and then you will get that sent right to you. It's totally free. And that is something if you are like, I am so great at growing all this stuff, but I feel real awkward when it comes time to talk to people at the market, then I strongly suggest that you give that a look over and see. And if you have any questions, by all means, let me know. But once you are on there, you will get my um, regular updates. I don't, you know, I don't spam anyone. I don't send out a billion updates, but you will be on my list. And I do have a podcast coming out soon that is all about simplifying selling and marketing. And that is called Sell It Sister, which is also the name of my my flagship course is also sellitsister.net. You can read more about that, but it's a, it's my simple, very simple sales and marketing course that is meant to not take up too much of your life, but have a big impact in the realm of making you feel more confident around selling and actually giving you a solid plan on working smarter and not harder when it comes to selling. 
Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today, Erica. This has been a, a fascinating conversation. Yeah. Thank you for having me, Michael. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have